boundaries on relationships starting today. And so we're going to be taking today and next Sunday, we're going to be laying a foundation around um, tips and strategies for communicating in a healthy way in relationships. Um, and then we're going to deal with romantic relationships on the third Sunday of this month. Then we're going to delve into other areas such as forgiveness, such as um, relationships with siblings and anger and violence. And then we're going to also deal with um, hopefully a broader understanding of our relationship to the world and people who are different from us before it's all over. Amen? So this is a series that hopefully can come around from time to time because, you know, we can never get enough of relationship stuff because it's who we are. Amen? Amen. All right. Um, well, to get us started with this series, I know you guys have probably videoed out, but I think you'll enjoy this. I wanted to <laughs> give an introductory video to introduce this um, piece. So, Devin. It's just, there's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me and I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head and it's relentless. And I don't know if it's gonna stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most is that I don't know if it's ever gonna stop. Yeah. Well, you do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there. Stop would... trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing- You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. No, see, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, out. you're not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just, sometimes it's like, there's this achy, I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. Yeah, I, that sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Oh, come on, Ow. if you would just- Don't! Try to see things my way Do I have to keep on talking till I can go on? So this video is just kind of introducing um, this relationship series, especially um, these next two sermons that deal specifically with communication, how we communicate, how we relate to one another, right? And why it's so important for us to learn new ways and healthier ways um, of doing that. The passage of scripture that was read this morning for you is a passage of scripture we're going to be working from um, both weeks. We're going to be in John chapter 21. So if you have your Bibles, and if you have one of the church Bibles, it's on page 883. Turn to the Gospel according to John, chapter 21. This week we'll deal with the first 14 verses, and then next week we'll finish up the chapter. <coughs> As we deal with strengthening the bedrock of relationships, which is communication. Part of it. John 21, verses 1 through 14. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Bible. All right. So John 21, verses 1 through 14, reads as follows. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. And they said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? And they answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. 
When the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and some bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of the large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Can we say thanks be to God? Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer. God, we thank you that um, in your graciousness and in your wisdom and your providence and kindness towards us, that you are always seeking to teach us to, and to grow us in ways that will make our lives better. And so we ask that the power of your spirit will open our ears to hear, our hearts to receive, God, such that we may be better in loving you and others and ourselves as a result of hearing what it is you have for us. God, wherever we are, meet us exactly in that place. God, allow us to own our own stuff and allow us to take charge of trusting you and helping us do that. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Strengthening the bedrock of relationships, part one. So, relationship is pretty much the core of who we are. Why? Because Genesis tells us that we are created in the image of God. All right? And that means a lot of things, but at its core, it means that we are created in the image of God, which means we are relational, we are communal at our core, all right? We relate to each other. We were created out of God's love to be loved by God and to love God and other people in return, all right? So that's our core identity. That's our core basis um, of humanity. That means that we don't really exist. It's unavoidable to not be in relationship with people. Like, we have to be. Right? And I know that's disturbing to a lot of people because we like to think we don't need nobody. Right? All I can need myself and I. Right? The whole Beyonce. <laughs> yeah, we do the Beyonce thing. But that's not true. Like, we are even reliant on people that we don't even know. Right? You drive down the street at nighttime and there's a light post. Right? Somebody had to put that post up. Right? And if that light bulb goes out, somebody else has to change that light bulb. Someone else manufactures the light bulb. Another person creates the means for you to get up to the post to change the light bulb. And in every area of our lives, whether it's clothes, whether it's food, whether it's the house we stay in, right? In every area of our lives, we are reliant on people who do things that we need to get done, even though we might not even know. It is a fact of our existence that we are relational people. We are reliant and dependent upon other people as other people. But we are also dependent upon the grace of God. None of us, whether we acknowledge it or not, exist apart from the grace of God. God has created us in certain ways that our lives are sustained without us doing anything to sustain it. Right? I'm breathing right now. But I'm not telling myself, breathe in, Mom. Breathe out. Breathe in. <laughs> breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. Otherwise, I would not be able to preach the rest of this sermon. Right? You all wouldn't have made it to church this morning because you would have woke up, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out, right? Life would not be life if we had to think about breathing. We don't have to do that. God created us in a way that we don't have to do that. Science tells us our heart beats and our brain sends a signal to our heart telling it to beat, but that we are unconscious of that, meaning we don't will our own hearts to beat. That means that it's by the will of God that our hearts beat in our chest every day apart from our consciousness. Right? So we are dependent upon our relation or connection to God whether we acknowledge it or not. Doesn't matter. Right? I can believe all day long that cows don't produce milk, but that don't make, mean it ain't true. Right? We don't have to believe something for it to be true. And so here's what we are getting ready to tackle as we move into this passage today. Because I believe that there are some really clear things in this passage that can help us learn what it means to be in better relationship and communication with the people we have to relate to regardless because it's a part of who we are, right? It's the basis of our humanity, right? So at the start of this passage, this is the third time 
Jesus has appeared to the disciples um, since his resurrection. All right, he has not ascended to heaven yet, but this is the third time he appears. And so Peter, who is the leader now of the disciples, says, I'm going fishing, all right? And likewise, the disciples say, well, I will, we will go with you. So they go out all night long, they're fishing, and they don't catch a thing, right? Very reminiscent of the first time Jesus met them. They were out fishing, right? And couldn't catch anything. So the scripture says that, or this account, John's account says that the, um, the dawn is breaking. So, you know, light is starting to come. There's a man on the beach, and that man is Jesus. We know it's Jesus. They don't know it's Jesus. Right? And we are unsure whether or not they're too far to tell whether or not it's Jesus, or whether or not their eyes are kept from seeing that it's Jesus, or whether Jesus looks very different. Right? Either way, they don't know it's Jesus. All they know is that there's a man on the shore. Right? So dawn is breaking. This man calls out to the disciples. He says, children, you haven't caught any fish, have you? They said, no. He was like, okay, well, cast your net on the other side of the boat, and you will find some. Right? They do it, and they have so many fish in the net that they can't even haul it up, right? Just amazing. So the beloved disciple, right, who we never really find in the scripture a name for, a lot of people think it was John, right? This beloved disciple was this disciple that Jesus, he was like a favorite, right? We all still love by Jesus, right? But, you know, this was one that was loved especially by Jesus, and who loved Jesus in a very special way, right? He says, oh my goodness, that's Jesus on the shore. It's like, Peter, that's the Lord. Now, Peter is naked. And we don't know why. <laughs> His brother is out fishing naked <laughs> on a boat. And maybe some things are better left, you know, not questioning. But in his excitement, I mean, this just like, I mean, really crazy excitement. He puts on clothes to jump in the water, right? Because he's so excited to get to the safety of his family of his Savior, right? Now, most times, we would take off clothes and then jump in the water, so it won't put them down. But no, he puts on clothes, jumps in the water. <laughs> he goes to shore. The disciples thankfully say, well, we're not going to follow you into the water, right? So they bring the ship, the boat in. And when they get to shore, Jesus is there and he's already started a fire with charcoal. Like he's grilling fish already. But he says to them, he says, come and bring me some of the fish you've caught. Right? Now, I think it's, it's, it's important to know what is included in the account and why is that included. So the account says that there are over 153 fish in this net and that the net should have broke. Right? It should have broke under the weight of the fish, but it didn't. Right? And I find that pretty amazing because when God blesses us abundantly, he also creates a way for us to be able to retain those blessings. When in all accounts, we should not be able to hold them. They're so great for us. Right? It's also very interesting to me that Peter goes and hauls the fish in when all the men earlier couldn't even haul them in. Maybe it's his adrenaline. I don't know. Peter was really on something else, y'all. <laughs> but Peter goes and he gets some fish and Jesus invites them to eat breakfast with this is a very familiar action. They're used to Jesus feeding them. They're used to being fed by the Lord, right? They're used to eating and supping with God. And so they're fed. And it says that none of the disciples ask who this is because they know emphatically through this act of eating with him that this is Jesus. Which implies that maybe Jesus didn't look like he normally does. We do know that Jesus shows up a lot of different ways sometimes, right? And sometimes it's not always the same way. But it's still Jesus. Amen? All right, so we're going to delve into the first part of communicating <coughs> or strengthening our communication skills in relationships. And we're dealing with just, just basic relationships, any kind of relationship you may find yourself in, just in terms of how we relate to each other, all right, um, through this text. So it's important to remember that, you know, God is a relational God. We're created in the image of this relational God. God loves us, right? And love implies that vulnerability. Right? To love someone is to be vulnerable with them. Right? Which means that God is a vulnerable God towards us. And God is also emotional. Or how can you be vulnerable if you're not emotional? Right? Our souls are what we say needs to be, need to be said. Right? The soul is the will, the thoughts, and the emotions. Now, it's important to remember, even though we're created in the image of God, we are still being redeemed. 
right? God is out. All right, so God is in perfection in this space, right? We are trying to get there. So this is why it's important for us to be intentional in how we grow, in how we are in relationship with other people, right? This is, not, this is stuff we have to practice and work at, right? Because we haven't arrived as God has or always has been, all right? So let's delve into this. The first thing I think we need to, to look at in this passage about communication is that we, we have to communicate with others from a posture of humility, okay? From a posture of humility. And what this means is that we are open to seeing things from other people's perspectives, and we're also open to doing things different or differently from how we're used to doing it, all right? So a posture of humility. We've got to be in relationship from a posture of humility. And we have to be open to seeing things from someone else's perspective, right? and be open to doing things differently or differently. All right, good stuff? So, if we're looking at the passage, we see that the disciples were master fishermen. They knew what they were doing, right? They had gone back to doing the old thing, even though know, Jesus had called them out of that. Sometimes we get very uncertain in life and we go back to what God has already called us out of, right? But either way, they knew what they were doing when they went fishing, right? So they were out fishing, they were master fishermen, this is what they did, and yet they had caught no fish. This unknown man, because they don't know it's Jesus, is standing on the shore and he says, cast your net on the other side of the boat. Now there is some humility that's going on in these disciples because even though this is their profession and they know exactly what they're doing, right? This man that they don't know is telling them to cast the net on the other side of the boat and they do it. Why? Because what they were doing wasn't working. So what do they have to lose by trying something different? But how often are we in relationships and what we're doing isn't working? And instead of changing and trying to do something different, we keep doing what we've always done, we just stay on cycle. Right? What would it look like if the disciples had said, no, we ain't kept what? Cast out not? It's the same work. Why would the fish come on this side? Right? If they're not on this side. No, they, they operated from a place of, of humility that says, well, hey, you know, what we've done hasn't worked yet, so let me just cast it on the other side. Yeah. And they got the desired result, right? So often I have heard interactions between family members where one family member says, you know, well, why are you getting so angry with me? We're just having a conversation. And the other, the other family member would say, well, I'm not angry in their most angry voice. <laughs> Right? It's not good enough for you to say just because I don't intend to be angry that you just need to get it together and not receive me in that way. That's not good enough. Right? If people are receiving you in a, in a specific way and that's what you're communicating to them, then you need to be open to seeing from their perspective how it feels to become that like that. Right? And you need to be open to doing it differently. So how can I change the way I interact with you, right? How can I be aware of that, right? Because how you, how a person receives you will determine how they respond to you. And that will determine whether or not what you want communicated actually gets communicated, right? But in the same respect, if you know you have a family member that's high strung, they just, you know, they just real excited all the time. You also have to be able to take that into account. It's called compromise, right? There are times when you have to know, I, I know, he or she probably isn't angry, but they sound angry. I can remind them, but it's probably not about me. Right? It's about this compromise. So I grew up as a person where every two or three people I would have a disagreement with called me defensive. <laughs> and I would go around, but I'm not defensive. What you talking about, I'm defensive? No, you just you need to stop attacking me. Right? Everybody attacking me. You had anything to say to me that would call me into a correction, you attacking me. Right? You just, you just you attack, right? And after I heard it so many times, I had to pull back. Mm -hmm. I had to pull back and I had to say, hey, maybe this, is, maybe this is me. You know, maybe I'm not seeing things from their perspective and, and I began to listen to how I sounded when people, I felt like people were attacking me. And I realized that half of them really weren't, or more than half, right? They were trying to love me. But I couldn't receive it because of what was going on inside of me. But I had to see it from their perspective, and I had to be willing to change the way I process stuff. Yes. 
right? So I had to be able to listen to someone, even now to this day, and I don't always get it right. Thank you, Jesus. I know my baby is like, no, you don't. <laughs> I don't always get it right because he's helped me a lot. That's he's helped me a lot in my defensiveness. But even to this day, I have certain boundaries for myself. We'll talk about boundaries next week. Whereas when I am in a conversation and I begin to feel defensive, I, I, I try to be very intentional about stopping in this thing. Because I know that it's, if I entertain my defensiveness, I will never hear what the other person has to say, and I will just lash out. So I do, I just, I just immediately, it's like a trigger for me, right? But that took some work, right? That took some work in terms of, and some humility. Right? Because it says in this moment, I might not get hurt, but I need to, you know, really understand that I need to see something from somebody else's perspective. I once had a friend. She didn't like to be surprised. And we were friends who liked to surprise her, like Jess, you know, picking and stuff. She hated that. And we never understood it, right? And when you know somebody hates something and you pick it on them, it just makes you want to pick on them more. Right? Okay, some of y'all don't get that, but the older siblings, I was a younger sibling, right? Older siblings don't know when to stop. <laughs> <laughs> and eventually she shared with us that she had once um, been a part of a traumatic event that, that involved an uh, element of surprise. And that every, whenever she is startled, right, even if it's for fun, it brings up issues of fear. Right? And this darkness from her. And so then we understood and we adjusted because we could see it from her perspective. But in truth, we should have been able to stop doing that when she first requested it. Because she had communicated to us, I don't like that. Right? There's always a reason for this stuff. Right? So the first point is make sure that you are always entering the space with humility because your way may not be the right way, and at any given moment, it might not be the right way. Right? Which means that that should give you some humility in how you're dealing and relating to people. Second thing <laughs> that's important for us in this passage is that we need to be able to pay attention and listen to people with the intention of recognizing their humanity and understanding them. Pay attention and listen to others with the intention of recognizing their humanity and understanding them. Now this beloved disciple, right, didn't, wasn't able to visibly recognize Jesus on the shore, right? So how did he know it was the Lord? Of all the disciples, he was the first one to say, this is the Lord. The others still didn't know it, right? How does he know it? He knows because one, he listened to the instructions of Jesus. He listened to him. And he says, hey, this sounds like something Jesus was saying, right? This sounds like something Jesus was saying. But it wasn't just that. He also paid attention in his relationship with Jesus to what the outcomes were. So it wasn't just that he listened to Jesus, but after he did what Jesus said, the outcome is something that let him know that, hey, that's what happens when you obey Jesus. Right? This is what happens. He knew Jesus' character. He had spent time with Jesus. Right? He had listened to him. He had paid attention to what happens when Jesus is around. And the same kinds of things were happening, so he was able to recognize Jesus. He was able to understand, no, this means that Jesus is on the shore. Right? I don't know nobody else who can tell us to, to put the net on the other side of the boat in the same water and bring fish. Right? Only Jesus can do that. Right? So we have to be able to listen and pay attention, right? There's something to be said about being in a relationship with somebody who listens to you, right? And who is intentional, even though they may not agree with you. I'm not saying you gotta agree with them, but being intentional about trying to understand somebody, right? But this means that you really have to be consistent in spending time with that person. This happens over time. There was a movie that came out several um, years ago based upon the, oh, Relationships, I just <laughs> communication. <laughs> Called the Count of Monte Cristo, based upon the classic book by um, Alexander Dumas, right? And in the movie, in the movie, Edmond Dantes is the main character, and he has to go to prison because he's betrayed by his best friend, right? 
So he goes to this solitary prison as this poor, uneducated man, and he encounters another prisoner in there who educates him, right, who helps him escape, and who gives him access to a fortune. So when he escapes, he goes and he gets all this fortune, this money, this gold, and he goes, he disguises himself, and he goes back home to enact revenge on all the family members or the people he felt like did him wrong, right? So he goes back as the Count of Monte Cristo, and he discovers that the woman that he loves is married to the best friend who betrayed him. But this woman thinks he's dead, like she doesn't know that he's still alive. But he's sitting at her dinner table at a party with a lot of people, and she's listening to him, and she's like, man, this voice sounds familiar. And she's just startled because she's trying to place where she knows this man from. And as the night goes by, he reaches up as he's talking and he begins to play with the back of his hair. And immediately she knows that this is the man that she's been in love with all her life. Immediately. She holds out, right? She goes out afterward, you know, gives him a piece of her mind. The whole idea is that when we are able to be consistent, right, in paying attention to the people we're in relationship with, in listening to the people we're in relationship with. It doesn't matter what they look like or how many things are changing, we will be able to recognize them and know them. And that says something not only about us, but it does something for them to know that somebody loves me enough to pay attention to them and to listen to me with the intention of understanding. Yeah. Right? Because you can sit there acting like you're listening and you ain't heard a thing because you're trying to figure out in your head what to say next. Right? You heard one thing that just, just made you so mad. Oh no, I got I got I got what I'm gonna say that. Let me let's go back to what you said the first time because you ain't nothing or anything that they said after that. Right? So a way to practice this is to be able to be in a relationship in such a way that when someone is speaking, you stop and you listen. Right? And then you give back to them in your own words what you feel like they said. Okay, you listen, and then you give back to them in their own words what you feel like they said, and then you let them tell you whether or not that's right or wrong. All right? And then you're able to formulate your response. Right? So, pay attention. Know when something changes with them. Right? You gotta know when, you gotta get to know people well enough that you are close to and that you love. Or even that you are in a relationship with them. Sometimes it helps. Know this kind of stuff about your supervisor. Right? To pay enough attention to them to know that when they walk in, they're having a bad day. Okay, I got to rearrange how I, how I respond to them. Right? But we walk around in a culture that doesn't listen. We walk around in a culture that doesn't pay attention. That does not see the humanity of people. We just breeze over. Right? But we've got to be able to pull it back, pay attention. What makes someone upset? What makes them happy? Right? How will you know when something's different? Right? Because that helps ground them. It helps you communicate with them in a better way. Because you understand them. You get them. Amen? Amen. That helps us with our third point that we're moving to. <coughs> the third point is we need to be able to practice acts of love and give words of affirmation before having a difficult conversation or during times of transition and change. Be able to perform acts of love and give words of affirmation before a difficult conversation or during times of change and transition. All right? So one of the things we're going to talk about next week is we're going to get into the difficult conversation that Jesus is about to have specifically with people. Right? So this, this portion of the passage is preceding a very difficult conversation, right? That he's about to have. But it's also a very uncertain time for the disciples. Right? Jesus is about to ascend to heaven. They're about to take on something that they don't know what in the world they're doing, right? Everything feels different. Everything just feels changed, which is why they go back fishing, because that was something that made brought them comfort. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So Jesus says to them, come and eat with me. Come and do something with me that you're used to doing with me. Come and do something with me that makes you feel secure. Come and do something with me that we love to do together. Eat with me. I want you to know that this is, this is a regulating point for Jesus, right? Jesus says, come and eat. Before he has this really hard conversation. 
How many, let me leave your nervousness because you're so uncertain during this time of transition, right? Come and eat, right? Reconnect with me, right? Give me this thing, yeah. right? So too much change is a constant, right? So change happens. That change is going to always happen. But too much change at one time can be detrimental, yeah. right? Which is why a lot of doctors tell you that if you need to lose weight and you need to stop smoking, don't do both at the same time, yeah. right? You do one. And then you do the other, right? Because we need something to regulate, right? And this is actually a very natural thing for us, right? To have these regulating processes in our lives, right? For our bodies, right? And our human systems um, have systems or processes of regulating and balancing the norms in our life. Right? So for example, with our bodies, if I get too hot, I'm going to start sweating. Why? Because that's my body going what? Regulating my temperature so that it comes back to a relative constant state. Right? So even in your physical body, there are certain processes that regulate a constant state within you. Right? And it's no different for systems, human systems, families, relationships, right? Organizations. It's called homostasis. Right? And this concept is if one person changes in a system, in a human system, right? Everybody is affected and is changed by that. Right? But the problem is one or two people in the system will probably either consciously or unconsciously try to push against that and change things back to how it used to be. Right? So it's a positive thing if the person who's changed within the human system is changing for the better. Right? And it can be very negative for homostasis to come into that kind of situation because now someone's trying to change it back to a negative kind of state, right? But if someone has changed negatively in the system and people are fighting against that to bring it back to a normal or a healthy state, that can be positive. Homostasis is neutral. So it doesn't matter whether it's positive or negative. All homostasis does is it tries to regulate an internal environment, right? By making it constant or relatively constant. Right? And that's what we do, right? On a regular basis in our families and, and in our systems. Right? So that's what this what that's what these words of affirmation, right? And that's what these acts of love do in very difficult times. Right? They act as a regulating system, a foundational system to ensure that, you know, you're not getting too far thrown out, thrown out too far by change. So for example, if a father has to move away for a new job, and he takes his only child to the park, because that's what they do, they enjoy each other at the park, and he tells her, I love you so much, baby, but daddy has to take this job, right? And it's not because I don't love you, right? That's why I'm here at the park with you, because this is what we do, right? This is a place of comfort for her. He affirms her and tells her this. That doesn't mean that she won't have to adjust to the change, and there won't be some stuff that comes with adjusting to the change. But it makes it a lot easier. She doesn't have to worry that her daddy doesn't love her, right? Because he's done something that she's comfortable with that affirms her, and then he's introducing change, right? Now, this doesn't work for this daddy. If this is the first time he's taken her to the ball, <laughs> it doesn't work if he usually doesn't tell her that he loves her. If he's sporadically in and out of her life, right? It doesn't matter. That's not a comfort. To her, to her, this whole going to the park man was just a lie to butter her up. Right? Notice Jesus doesn't take the disciples bungee jumping. That ain't what they did. You know? He don't say, let's go water skiing. Hey, look up the seat to the boat. That's not something that they consistently did in that relationship that was healthy and that was fun and that was affirming. Right? That wouldn't be a place of comfort for them. That would just make them feel worse. So some of us, before we can even get to the place of, of being affirming during difficult times, or get to the place where we are doing acts of love during difficult times, sometimes we got to actually establish what are those acts of love. We got to establish some, some consistent words of affirmation so that we have something to fall back <laughs> Right? So if you're at that step, I don't care what relationship is in, right? Find ways to love the people around you that you're in a relationship with so that those are things that they don't question when something becomes difficult. Things that you say and they think you genuinely mean it because this isn't the first time you've said it. 
things that you do with them, and they think that this is something that that they you do because you really want to be with them, and not just because you're trying to butter them up. Right? right? There has to be consistency, and that's the one thing that runs through each of these three points. It has to be consistent. Communication in a healthy way is not something you can do once and say, oh, it didn't work, so I'm going to stop. You have to be consistent. Now, some of this stuff has to be worked out with a counselor. That's some stuff that we're dealing with in our life. <laughs> you, just, you need a mediator, right? And all of these points are working and intertwining with the points we're going to talk about next week. So that's something to keep in mind. But either way, all of these pieces are practical steps that can be used that have to be practiced and be consistent. And the other thing that you have to make sure that you're doing is that because we believe God, you have to be inviting God into these processes. Right? We know that the power of the Holy Spirit can do a whole lot of stuff that we can't do. Sure can. Especially on the days when we don't feel like communicating with them. And God, I don't feel like listening to her today. Oh my God. Like I listened to her yesterday and the day before and the day before. What's she gonna hear me? You need, you need Jesus in that minute. <laughs> so invite God in. Say, God, I don't feel like this, but Lord, I am trusting that this is what is making me who you created me to be. Like I cannot emphasize enough. I not stress enough that relationships are the foundation and the core of our existence and being. We don't exist apart from them. So we've got to really put in some work in making these things right and help. And you can't do that without the power of God. Don't think you just too far beyond us. But I do believe that God is a God that makes all things possible. I believe that this table today represents the greatest act of love and relationship that is known to humanity. There is nothing more powerful than what this table represents. This table says that I loved you so much and I want to be in relationship with you so much that I have removed every hindrance that will keep you from being in I want you to get it so much and I'm willing to cover all the times you get it wrong. I'm willing to bear that. I'm willing to hold it. This is Jesus saying, I'm willing to cry with you because that's what we do when we're in relationships. I'm willing to laugh with you because that's what we do when we love folk. I'm willing to correct you in love because that's what we do when we love folk. I'm willing to be patient with you and understanding you. I'm willing to go the long haul with you. I'm willing to never walk away from you. Never walk away from you because that's what you do when you're in loving relationships. saying, Holy Spirit, help me to be in relationship first with you, then with others and myself. That's what this is about. It's not about coming to this table and being perfect, y'all. And I would say this every time on Communion Sunday. This is not about perfection. If it was, none of us would come. Right? Jesus doesn't create processes for us to practice that none of us can actually attain. We come to the table to get what we need to get so that we can be who we need to be. So come today and receive the grace that God wants to give to you to be who you are. You struggling with your identity? Come get it. You struggling with whether or not you're beautiful or powerful? Come and get it. You're struggling with whether or not you have enough to offer, whether you have gifts or what your own worth and value. Come and get it at the table. That's what the grace of God is about. It's about covering all our brokenness so we can do this thing together. Today is World Communion Sunday. It's World Communion Sunday. And even though every time we partake of the body and the blood of Christ, it is a moment where we are joined to every believer everywhere in existence. Everywhere in existence. But today we highlight the fact that we join with our brothers and sisters all over this world who are saying that we believe in the power of the Holy Spirit to do things that we can't. 
We join with every brother and sister who are in war-ravished countries right now, who can't even live in their own houses because of the gunfire and the bombs that are dropping around you. But they're still believing in the grace and in the power of the Holy Spirit. We join with them today at this table. We join with the brothers and sisters who have to serve God in private because it is against the law to serve Him openly. We join with them today. And we say we bear that with we join with our brothers and sisters today who are incarcerated, who are on the street. We join our brothers and sisters who have lost family members, who are struggling to find their faith. We're joining with them today because we believe that there is no other existence apart from God. So we don't come perfect, but we come saying, God, we lay everything before you. That's all any of us can do. All we can do is every morning dig up and say, God, I don't know if this is right or wrong, but I'm going to lay it before you, and I'm going to trust you to do it this way, what you need to do it. Me included. So when you come to this table, you make yourself a living sacrifice, because that's what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be saying, God, all the stuff I get wrong, all the stuff I get right, sometimes I can't tell what's right and what's wrong. But you know what? I'm going to lay it all down. I'm going to trust you to work it out. That's the humility that we come to the table in. We are all equal at this table. Every single person is equal at this table. There is no poverty at this table. That's right. There are no salaries at this table. There's no education at this table. Only thing at this table is truth and love. Come on, man. Come on, Pastor. And God openly receives us at this table. We are becoming who we are created to be. That's what this series is about, and that's what that table is about. So this table is open to everyone who believes that Jesus Christ died for the remission of your sins. Let's take a moment. <laughs> because the one thing other people can't do for you, other people can't believe for you, other people can't repent for you, other people can't ask for forgiveness on your behalf. Only you can do that. So let's take a moment and be.